Welcome into Other People's Shoes, the podcast where listeners get to step into the lives of others and see the world through their shoes. Your host, Neil Matthews, is a seasoned interviewer who has a natural talent for empathizing with his guests and drawing out their unique perspectives. Through a combination of storytelling and insightful questioning, Other People's Shoes explores the lives of a diverse range of guests, from everyday people to celebrities and thought leaders. With a warm and welcoming style, Neil creates a safe and supportive space for guests to share their stories while also challenging listeners to broaden their perspective and think more deeply about the world around them. So tune in to Other People's Shoes with Neil Matthews and get ready to step into other people's shoes. Welcome in to Other People's Shoes. As you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. You thought I forgot my name, didn't you? Well, listen, I didn't. I know it. I've said it for like 44 years almost now. Okay, maybe not that long because, you know, there was that area of time where I couldn't talk. Yeah, believe it or not. Yeah, I actually grew up very late, delayed in speaking. Like my mom actually makes the joke. She wasn't sure I would actually ever learn to talk. And then once I learned how, I never shut up. That's her joke, not my joke. I am taking credit for said joke. I wonder about this for some of you out there. Are you a little late to the party? Well, let me help you get dialed in here. We're on this quest secretly. We've kind of sort of secretly said it sort of publicly said it too so maybe it's both but we're trying to cross off every state in the united states union now that does involve our friends to the north in alaska and hawaii now some of you might remember we did actually have hawaii so we're good there so we're fine through a series of amazing events not unfortunate amazing events we had a guest a while back that actually gave us seven people from our list of nine states and thank you to sarah for helping us today Welcome, my new friend, Allison. She is at the moment, so we're going to count it, in Alaska. And we finally get to go to the great, amazing state of Alaska. By the way, the part she's in, because I know some people will ask and want to know, she's in that one part in Alaska that stays light in the middle of the night. Now, for those of you who don't like the sun and need to sleep, this might not be a place to visit. But Allison is there. Help us today. Alice, how are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Well, that's awesome. So we talked about a little bit, being in Alaska is fun. It also has its challenges and the light being one of them. So help us with that. Help us understand like, what is it like there when that's going on? Well, everyone kind of gets a little manic in the summer because you've been starved of sun during the winter. Everyone wants to be outside all of the time. At midnight, it's still light. So your your brain wants to go through a Starbucks or something. Things are closed down because it's it is midnight. Your body doesn't quite know how to handle it. It's all right because our days change by six minutes every day. So winter is just around the corner already and it will be four hour days and 20 hour nights. You'll have a chance to hibernate and catch up on all the lost sleep. Do you find yourself sleeping more when, when that's going on? It's so dark. Your body just wants to go to bed and it's the winter and it's cold outside and there's not, you can't really do anything thing when it's dark and negative 10. When I moved here, people said to me, they said, oh, you know, there's no such thing as, as bad weather. There's just bad gear. I disagree heartily. And I think that there is really bad weather. And I've seen a fair amount of it <laughs> because in the middle of winter in Alaska, you don't play, am I on the road? You play, am I on the road? Because you're not sure <laughs> when it's whiteout conditions. All of a sudden, I feel like I need a cup of cocoa and an Eskimo jacket. I don't know why, but I, I just, I feel that way. That's fantastic. As I mentioned to you in the green room, I have some experience with Alaska. I sold to a number of businesses when I was back in my selling days, a wholesale company I worked for, ironically called Orca Cellular. So Orca like the whale. But I had a number of accounts in Alaska, Juno, Anchorage, Valdez even. And they would tell me about this sun dilemma of it being up. And one of the people in particular, her name is Becky. 
And Becky said people in the middle of the night would be painting their house. And it's like two in the morning and they're painting their house. And I'm like, no, that, that doesn't happen. And she goes, oh, Neil, you have no idea until you're up here and you experience it. That sounds crazy. I love to lead off every show with this question. Would love to continue it with you. And that's this question is what style of shoe do you love to wear? I love shoes. <laughs> Oh, I found my sister in the shoe game. Yay. Why do you love shoes? Being a creative person, I have a wide variety. I suppose the one element that is all throughout all of my shoes is that they are comfortable. I have lots of trainers and I'm really like in love with hokas right now because they just like hold my feet sandals and you name it. I have, I have a pair in every color and just about every style comfortable. My wife is now on the Hoka train wagon, whatever you want to say. We yeah. finally broke down. She bought a pair of Hoka's. I don't think she's truly in love with them. She wants them to be wider. And I'm like, they're running shoes. Running shoes shouldn't be wide. They should be narrow. And she's not a fan of that. She does love Hoka's. I still have not gotten on the Hoka wagon. I keep hearing from people saying I need to just do it. It, but I can't. I don't know what it is. The shoe just seems so heavy. They're light. They're really light. They are big. They're really wide because I get the walking ones. I have really high arches, so they're really, really comfortable. They're just so comfortable for me. That's why people keep saying that I need to get them because I had plantar fasciata a number of years back, which is oh, yeah. the worst. I had that too. I would not wish that on my worst enemy. Honestly, it really helped me. It helped my husband too because he had the same issue. When we reached out to you and proposed to you that this idea of your only, your response was actually pretty comical. And at least in my mind, as I'm reading it is you said, and I'm quoting you here, you said, you're only a person. Is there yeah. more to that? I mean, you're a blogger, you're a writer, you're these things. And I thought, what a great description, a very limited description. So help me with this. As all things blogging, I get a literally, what is that? A five word answer. You are only a person and really a two word answer, a person. It was a big deal to just be a person. In my blog, I, I talk a lot about narcissistic abuse. And when you're in, a, in an abusive relationship, you're not really a person, you're a tool for their use. You are an object that they play with, use and abandon at their whim. Within the Christian sphere, too, there is this pressure on women. You're not just a person. You have to be a, you have to be a perfect mother. You have to be the perfect wife. You have to have a perfect house. The, the goal is not to just be a person, but to be a perfect person. And for me, I had a lot of, in ministry, I've done a lot of ministry over the years. There's this pressure to be kind of a savior. And so to save people, that too, isn't something that humans, that we can do. Only Jesus can do that. When I began to realize that the only thing that the Lord expected from me was to be a person and to be Alice. And so then I could be Alice as a mother and Alice as a wife and Alice in ministry and Alice as a writer. I didn't have to be a, an object I didn't have to be a role. I could just be a person. It took a lot of pressure off. Do you think growing up for you were put in that role of being an object? And do you think maybe that's where it comes from? Not so much. I think from my parents to fall into a narcissistic relationship is not really a lot of ways the victim's fault. You have a predator who has set their sights on you and they study you very carefully. They love bomb you at first and they want very, very interested in everything about you because they're gathering information to be able to kind of hook you. The abusive cycle becomes very addictive. It's neglect and abuse, then a period of love bombing to keep you there. And so you're always living in hopes of they're going to change and they're going to be that good person again. That Romeo that they enact, that charming person built on deception. Having now talked to over 3 million women have read my blog, that says to me that a lot of women fall into this category of being deceived into to a relationship with someone who does not have their best interests at heart, but instead intends to use them to make themselves feel good. So did you come out of a narcissistic type relationship? My parents weren't. They were good people. They were very naive. My first husband was very much so. None of us really knew how to deal with it. We thought, oh, well, he's going to grow out of this. 
They don't. They just get increasingly worse. About 10 years of marriage, I managed to escape with my four daughters. People say, well, why did you stay so long? Not realizing that you never ask a woman who's in an abusive relationship why they stay so long. You ask them once they're gone, how did you manage to escape? Every time I would leave, he would come after me. It takes an average of four attempts for a woman in an abusive relationship to escape. So when I was growing up, for whatever reason, my mom was watching this movie one time. I had to look it up to make sure I was right. Sally Fields plays, Not Without My Daughter. And for those who haven't seen that movie, it's an old movie, 91, by the way, Google has it at. And it's a PG-13 movie. So as far as I know, there there isn't too much negative to it, but there is some emotional stuff to it. She is in Iran and she's basically held in Iran against her will. And her husband is just awful to her. And she ends up wrecking the movie for those that maybe want me to stop. Fast forward. She ends up escaping with her daughter through Turkey and through some underground railroad type means to get back to the States, to Michigan, where she's from. And I remember watching that movie as a kid. And I thought to myself, I mean, at 91, I'm, I'm 11. I remember thinking to myself, that doesn't seem right. He, the way he's treating her, the way he's treating their daughter, why is he doing that? I had no concept of a husband doing that to his wife, at least in my recollection may have been the first time I witnessed any kind of domestic violence or domestic oppression, domestic hostility in that movie type setting. term for it is called intimate terrorism now. Intimate terrorism. Yes. Seriously. It's true. It's the most accurate term, I think. Maybe the obvious question is you did leave, as you mentioned, left with your four daughters. What was the breaking point for you? Okay, enough's enough. I gotta go. I had been really seeking the Lord the last couple of years. In order for me to, to just stay sane, I was in a lot of prayer, praying for him, also just having a relationship with the Lord, really on my own. Because I'd gone to church and I was the first Christian in my family. It takes a while for us to really learn how to have a relationship with the Lord. I came home one day and I I attempted to escape and I had some pastors who were very helpful to me as well in that whole process. Came home and had all of these seedlings that I had been growing that I was going to plant in the garden that spring because I always had a big garden. He had thrown them all away. I went upstairs. I heard the Lord say in my spirit, everything that you plant, he will uproot. I was like, okay, Lord, are you telling me to leave? What is it that you're telling me I need to do because I will do whatever it is that you want me to do. I just laid my life down. And this Bible verse came to my mind and I didn't know what it was. And I, I looked it up and it was just this one line. It said, let these men go. And it's talking about, I believe it's Paul talking about these men who are lovers of selves. And I was terrified of divorce. I was so worried. Again, there's that perfect thing coming into play. He gave me another Bible verse. I didn't know what it was. And I looked it up and it was just the line. And neither do I condemn you. I just knew I was the only one working at the time. So I went and I rented an apartment, got the girls and we left. I was making 24,000 a year. I didn't get child support for the first couple of years that I got 300 a month, but the Lord came through and he took care of us. And somehow it was not fleeing that time. That last time it was, I know that the Lord is directing me to leave and I'm going to go. And I did. And I left in strength. Whereas before I had fled in weakness and fear. When you talk about being, you're only a person. Do you think that gives you the margin, the green light or the permission to be okay, to be able to make mistakes, to be human? Absolutely. Why is that so important that you know that and maybe others know that? We have a tendency to think of ourselves in terms of the roles that we play. Parental guilt is such a thing. The older they get, the more you realize that you couldn't see everything that they needed, that you couldn't provide for them. And you would have if you could have. I had to learn is that instead of comparing myself to everyone else and how it is that they do it, women who are just really good at being in the classroom and they're room moms and they're cupcake moms and I was never a cupcake mom. If you want to stay and talk about deep concepts until midnight, I'm that kind of mom. I don't have to be this false image of what a perfect mother is. I am Alice who loves her children as only Alice can love them. And I'm just a person, also a mother. It's all of these expectations that I think women put on themselves to the way that you look and the way that you act and the way that you keep a home, present yourselves, making sure that the fires are stoked in your marriage and all of these things. We add the the whole idea of perfection onto ourselves. Women shame ourselves a tremendous amount. And if we're just allowed to be people, we're not responsible for the well-being 
well-being of our husbands. Their happiness is their responsibility. As adults, a husband is responsible for whether or not he's happy or not. But we put that burden on ourselves and our children too. We take care of our children, but we can't guarantee that they're always happy. We have to let them learn how to be people too. I meet somebody, undoubtedly somebody tries to give me their title first. When you meet a doctor, well, I'm Dr. So-and-so. You meet an athlete and the first thing they say is the athlete's accolade, like if it's a football player, Super Bowl champion Emmett Smith, an example. They always use that title first and, and maybe rightfully so. Like a doctor's earned that title, maybe an athlete's earned that award, but it almost feels like so many times we think about the accolade first of how that person's defined and then we think about the, the person in your case. Why is that a danger if we continue to do that or if somebody allowed to do that to you. Like they put that label on you almost first rather than getting to know you. You know, we all struggle with narcissism a little bit. And one of the definitions for narcissism is, is presenting a false face to the world. And what happens is, is as you're creating this perfect persona, who you are really as a person is shrinking more and more. To be a real person and authentic in relationship, you have to be vulnerable. You have to show who you really are. You have to show your cards. And when we interact just on that surface level of a resume, then what we're doing is, is we're actually we're just bumping into each other's surfaces. That's not real relationship at all. My husband has worked for doctors for the last 20 years. Some of the doctors are wonderful doctors, but I'll tell you what, some of them, it's almost as if all they are is a doctor because you can't find the real self under there. I went to the University of California, Irvine and the medical program there. When I was there, they started out on the first day with all their med students saying, you know, you are the gods of this society. You control life and death. And I'm thinking, what a terrible message to send to them. What a terrible thing to say to a 22 year old medical student because they will never get to be a person. Well, I would think not, especially if they feed into that ego more and more. So since it sounds like you were maybe the resident an expert on narcissism. Well, I, I know a lot about it. <laughs> so if somebody right now is saying you're only ever going to be a narcissist, would your response to them would be what? There are no reported cases of any narcissist being therapeutically cured. The only narcissist in the Bible that was ever cured was Nebuchadnezzar. He was a grandiose narcissist and it took God turning him basically into a cow for seven years to turn him around. Yes, if someone has the personality disorder, and I don't mean if they have narcissistic tendencies because everyone has some narcissistic tendencies. We blame others for our things. We don't take responsibility for our actions. All of those are narcissistic. For someone who has genuine narcissistic personality disorder, really any cluster B, there is no therapeutic cure for, for that. Yeah, once a narcissist, probably always a narcissist. Some therapists might disagree with me and that's fine. I've never seen it myself either. So you feel like once you're kind of in that mode, you're only ever going to be a narcissist? The personality disorder, yes. Okay. Yeah, which is a genuine mental disorder. A personality disorder is different than a mental illness. Very different. It's a very, it's a flaw in the basic personality of the person. In the 1800s, they used to call it moral insanity. And I will sometimes wonder if it wasn't a more accurate term. And even in the Bible, when it says, have nothing to do with these men, let these men go, it's talking about men who are seekers of their own pleasure, who defy all authority, who, who take advantage of weak women, that whole long list. There's like 20 things in that list. And it says, have nothing to do with these men. Think of a guy that comes to mind right now, and that's Ted Bundy infamous for being a serial killer. And they said he was very narcissistic in everything he did. A lot of those serial killers were just being very narcissistic. He is a psychopath. So that's a couple. Also steps that up. too, I would think. Yeah. Those are all cluster B disorders. So cluster B is borderline narcissistic, sociopath and psychopath. Narcissists generally tend to be law abiding because they don't want people to think they're a bad person. Sociopaths take that a step further. They'll do something bad if they can get away with it. Psychopaths genuinely feel no stress at the idea of doing bad things and or getting caught. They just, they don't feel any stress or fear at all. And they have no conscience whatsoever. So narcissism, sometimes narcissism will lead to a psychopathy. It's not difficult to tell someone who has narcissistic tendencies. They lack empathy. They're not able to enter into anyone else's pain. They don't forgive. They're very manipulative and controlling. 
what's theirs is theirs and what's yours is theirs too. So they have this entitlement. Everything is about them. And by the way, there's plenty of narcissistic women too. I don't want you to think that I'm, I'm saying that they're only men because that is not true. Women just get away with it better than men do. I had a friend who left her narcissistic husband and he said, oh, I, f- I feel like my arm is missing. She was the person that did everything for him. She was the thing that got things for him. It's, uh, so narcissism starts when you're two years old. You don't get your needs met. You stay in that infantile phase of nobody else is a person. They're merely extensions of me. They're supposed to be filling my needs. They exist to serve me. If you don't take care, if you you don't fill those emotional needs of your two-year-old, then they can get stuck in that phase for quite a long time. So you mentioned leaving your husband. It took some time and you got free. You feel better because of it. Yeah. When did you start to maybe notice that, hey, something's not right here. Something's not, something's not really clicking. It's kind of going awry. And maybe you denied it because clearly it took some time to finally go. But when was that maybe first initial moment? And did you know it at the time or did you have to kind of go and do some research on that? I knew that I was in an abusive relationship. I was at this public restroom and they had a poster on the wall that listed 10 things. And if you could answer yes to any of them, you were in an abusive relationship and I could answer yes to nine of them. And so I was like, oh, this is real. I didn't know the term narcissism until years after I'd left. When I began to get therapy and inner healing and and begin to realize, oh, wait a minute here, there's more to this, that I'm not the only one who suffered this. One of the few women, Christian women who write about it from a first person standpoint, I'm not afraid of him anymore. That's why you rarely hear firsthand accounts from women is the men that they left are very dangerous. Ever allowed yourself the what if I had never left? moment? Oh, yeah, I think it would have it would have killed me. I had a lot of illnesses that disappeared within six months of me leaving. Like health challenges? Yes. I was constantly injuring myself, fell down the stairs. He didn't push me down the stairs. I just sprained my ankle really badly. I wasn't in my body because it wasn't safe to be in my body. Very dissociated. I had migraines and I had ulcers and I had all of these health are all stress related. I think eventually Eventually, it probably would have killed me. And he was beginning to get very violent. I wonder sometimes if I had stayed, if he would have ended up killing me. So if a lady's listening right now and they feel like they're in that spot where you were, what would you tell them in this moment? If they are in an abusive relationship and they need out, they need to be very careful about how they do it. They need to gather their resources financially. They need to gather people around them who can help me. The the Lord sent me people that could help me, that understood what I was going through. I know that God was on my side in this. I do. I believe that he is there and willing to help anyone who's caught in an abusive and frightening relationship. It takes some time and thought. They will always come after you. If you can't leave a narcissist because it makes them look bad. Maybe that's why for you, being a person was so important to you. Mm -hmm. Because you were no longer an object. You were no longer a thing. You were no longer a trope you know, adjective you want to insert in there. You were no longer that. You got to be free. Yeah. How powerful does that make you feel when you think back on that? And what in that moment, what do you think your daughter saw in those days of you leaving and now? Powerful. I remember when we moved out to our home, the, the last time that we were all gone, you need to understand that when people are in an abusive relationship, they don't even tell themselves how terrible it really is. So it takes years for them to process their story, to to even begin to admit just the degradations that they suffered. The first thing that we said to ourselves in our new home was, oh, we don't have to lie anymore. I think about that. It grieves me so much. We're at this point where we had to lie to survive. You walk on these eggshells and you protect the narcissist from any information that might upset them. Only what you don't realize is that it doesn't matter what you tell them or don't tell them. They use unpredictability to control you. Unpredictability of temper is a strategy that they use to keep you on those eggshells. All of my daughters have grown up to be amazing. I have one psychologist, one deputy director of marketing for AmeriCorps, one who just got her master's in applied statistics and one who is who is studying for law schools. And each of them, I am proud to say, has gone through on their own accord therapy to deal with issues left over from that. They've learned how to be people, which I'm really, really thrilled about. You don't have your faith 
Are you able to walk through this? Yes. Here's the thing I believe is that God loves everyone. He sees women and men who are in abusive situations. And I think that he knows that sometimes being in an abusive situation makes it very difficult to hear his voice. I think that, yes, I believe that it's possible for people who do not have faith to leave and grow and become emotionally mature. I think that they are missing out on a tremendous amount of grace and healing. Yes, I think I think that too. One of the things that people don't like to admit to is the fact that serious emotional abuse can really make it difficult to experience God. It injures your spirit. Your spirit is where you experience God. There has to be some healing that takes place before a belief in God can even begin to feel like something that could happen. Sometimes people are really injured, and that's why their ideas of God get very, very off. I think he sees through that and is able to love them through that. Usually he has to love them through that, through people. I think so many times with people in general is they think, oh, God's just your crutch. I've heard people say, well, God's just your imaginary friend. He didn't really pull you through. You had your own ability and your persuasive ways. A series of unfortunate events got you there. You found a way to get out of that. And they find ways to almost diminish or water down the power of what God can really do. I think the Lord actually directly intervened. For me, I was in the hospital hospital getting my gallbladder removed. And I visited a church one time. The pastors came and visited me in the hospital after that one time. And the pastor's wife, who she was also a pastor, she looked at me and she said, the Lord has told me that if you need a place to stay with your children, you can stay with us. And she said, I have never said that to anybody ever. The next day I had nowhere to go with the kids. I went there and I stayed there for a week and we got on our feet. That was the time before the time we were able to, I was able to leave, but it was only, they're only about three months apart. This period of time where there's a ramping up, I would imagine. There's so much of a plan, I would imagine, as you try to script it out. Okay, is this going to work? Is that going to work? I don't think it all happens at once. I mean, it'd be amazing, but it's not a Hollywood lifetime movie, not trying to diminish your story by any means. I think that's the reality. Have you been able to forgive him? You know, it's interesting to me because they would have no idea what it was that he had done, but they would say, well, you know, you have to forgive him. And that's such a religious response. To forgive somebody is something that you have to do. It's a process. It's a process of grieving. You just don't blanket forgive somebody. Do I forgive him for having ruined so many Christmases? Okay, I can forgive him for that thing at a Christmas. Can I forgive him for having called me these names? Yes, I can forgive him for that. It's it's a, it's a teasing out of a very complicated ball of thread. And so to say to someone, well, you need to forgive him is to totally misunderstand the nature of forgiveness. Do I live in wrath? No. Wrath is a revengeful, punishing anger. I have no wrath for him. Do I still get angry at when I see the consequences of his actions in my daughter's lives? Yes. And do I have to forgive him for those things? Well, I have to let them go and trust that the Lord will take care of them and free me from the burden. The burden of justice is no longer on me. I don't have to exact justice. That is fully in God's court. I live, I think, in a tremendous amount of freedom because of it. I think so many times when I think of forgiveness, it is a hard thing to kind of wrap my my brain around. Joked, it's almost like Helen Keller doing long division, which is probably a bad omen to Helen Keller. She was blind, so I choose to forgive somebody, and it is a choice. What I'm saying in my heart, and maybe this is where we're different, or maybe this is where we're the same, is in my heart I say to them, I'm choosing not to hold that against you any longer. That's exactly it. I give up my right to revenge. That doesn't mean I forget everything that you did. It doesn't mean that I'm not still bugged by the scar that was left, the hurt that was on my heart, the pain that was caused, or the mismemory that didn't take place. But I'm choosing every day to say, I'm not holding that against you any longer. And even when those things come up. It's not reconciliation either. You cannot reconcile with a person who is not sorry and repentant for the things that they've done. And I think that's sometimes where I think people really get a little bit sideways, their halo's on a little too tight, crooked a little bit. You forgave them. Now you immediately need to jump back in to have a relationship with them and they need to be involved in your life and you need to have tea parties with them and invite them over to everything. I'm thinking of Alice now of the tea party thing. Couldn't help but have a little Alice in Wonderland reference there. Had to weave that in there somewhere. That's not what he's saying there. I don't think. You're right. It's not. It's some people are dangerous. I don't mean necessarily even 
physically dangerous. They can be spiritually or emotionally or mentally dangerous for you. You don't need to poison yourself. Jesus was very, very picky about the close friends that he kept. Kind and friends to all. He was close friends with few. I agree with you completely. I think that that reconciliation in the case of a narcissist, something that is not advisable. <laughs> I have seen abusive men repent and abusive women repent and it gets better. For someone who is a full-blown narcissistic personality disorder, I've never seen it get better. Anywhere in the journey, had he come to you and said, listen, and truly repented? Oh, he did it in front of church. Gotten on his knees, begging for forgiveness, sobbing. Wow. And was it all an act? Yes. Yes, it really actually That was. feels next level. <laughs> It is next level. It's such a mind game. Pastors I mentioned earlier, he actually went to that church and he said, pray for my family and I just give my family to the Lord. Finally managed to leave and get a restraining order and all that kind of stuff. Afterwards, she came to me. She goes, I knew the minute that he said that, that you were going to be free. Because I felt the Lord said, I am going to take your family. I am. And they're going to be safe from you. It was... Some of the most religious people are, are narcissists. In fact, they just did a study, Assemblies of God Pastors. Now, I go to an Assemblies of God church, and my pastor is a lovely, lovely person. I will say that. In their study, they found that 80% of Assemblies of God Pastors were narcissists, and other denominations were similar. Sometimes the most religious people that you come across are fully narcissistic, which explains why Jesus didn't really get along with the Pharisees. So do you feel like in your heart, even though you said, hey, I'm a person now, do you feel like there's still some lingering effects like you're only going to be an abused wife? You're only going to be this. I don't feel limitations. Once you start following after the Lord, he's led me on quite an adventure. It's like my job now is something that I would never have dreamt of doing. And it is the most fun ever. And it uses all of my talents and it uses all. Even that storehouse of grief that I have to craft a narrative arc for whole multiverse of characters in a Christian context, giant project of a whole mobile game platform. Who gets to do that? I don't feel limited. I feel like bizarrely enough, everything that I went through, he has been in the process of redeeming these last 20 years. It gives me gravitas in my fiction that I wouldn't have. It gives me an understanding of myself and others. And it also gives me empathy for people who suffer from and are stuck in similar situations. Be a person is to give everyone else in your life to be a person, permission to be a person. They find it just as freeing when they don't have to be a fill in the title. God created me to be a person. I taught for 27 years at a university, English and creative writing, mostly at Christian universities. And I'd ask the students, what is the biggest gift God has ever given you? And of course, they always think that the right answer is Jesus. And I'm like, no. The biggest, most important gift he's ever given you is you. Because without you, Jesus wouldn't have come. Just you being, you're the gift. Some would push on that and say, that sounds narcissistic. It does sound narcissistic. Here's the thing, though, is what does it say in John? He who says they're without sin, the truth is not in them. Those who don't admit to wrong, they are not just people. They are trying to be more than people. And so the truth is not in them. It's not narcissistic to be a person and to know that you're loved. So if we took you back in time somehow, some way, maybe it's through a DeLorean. I've heard those are pretty good at time travel. Not sure, though. <laughs> to say 20 years ago, when you were still kind of walking through this experience, what would you tell that younger self that the new self knows? I would tell myself I was in the process of the divorce and I was very numb. And if I had been less numb, I could have gotten the divorce over with so much quicker because I still thought I was going to be a good person and not slam him in court because that was the thing to do, which it wasn't the right thing to do. The right thing to do was just to tell the truth. I was trying to be noble and good. He had gotten it into his head because he was seriously insane that he had figured out a way he was going to get me put in jail. He never said what it was that he had on me. And it, of course, it was a, just a mind game that they play. I was terrified by it. And because he was so intimidating and I'd learned, he had taught me over 10 years to be very afraid of him, is to hold absolute sway and terrorize 
this woman and your four little girls, kingdom of five that you're going to terrorize. And I was at church one night and they had a woman preacher come through and she came over to me and she looked at me and she said, the things that you fear will not come to pass. And that was what got me through the divorce. If I could have just held on to that more. If I could say to myself in the middle of this marriage, I would say the things that you fear most will will not come to pass. I didn't have to be so afraid of this person. Cautious, yes. Wise in how I dealt with leaving, yes. I didn't have to live in just such crippling fear. And that was what had been cultivated. And that's what an abuser does is they cultivate fear in you. Learning how to live without fear is something I'm still doing. My husband now, I've been married 19 years and he's a wonderful man. When he asks me to do something, there's still something in me that's like, oh, I better do it. And then I'm like, wait a minute, this is not who I'm married to now. Those instinctive fears take a long time to get rid of. Well, I think there's so many ladies out there that would probably echo what I'm going to say right now. And and that's bravery. I think it takes bravery to make a stand to say, one, I'm not going to put up with this nonsense anymore. But when you got three little babies, sounds like at the time to protect them to that mama bear instinct probably kicks in a little bit. I'd imagine. Again, I don't oh, have yeah. the mama bear instinct. <laughs> I just applaud your efforts for saying not on my watch, no longer. I'm not going to tolerate that any longer. Trauma to break free from that must have just taken a toll on you. Oh, yeah. It did. The Lord has been really good to me. He has goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Once I really just cast off all of the the legalism, I guess. I mean, to just be a person, to not have to follow all of the rules that aren't really rules anymore. In some ways, I owe it to my parents. My father began to understand what was going on and he researched it. And so the last time I left, he came out and he stayed with me and he said, I'm going to stay here until I know you're not going to go back. And I so appreciated that. I needed that family support. I needed that permission from them to be the first one to get a divorce in the family. We're talking about accomplishments. I don't know if that's something you want to have. What wisdom for your dad to say, hey, I'm going to stick with you until then. I mean, not everyone has that either. To have a dad to really kind of set that tone for you. What a great support. I mean, it's great to say God's in my corner. We know that on an emotional level, but sometimes it is great to have that person there. It was. It was really helpful to me. And I needed it because he was there and he answered the phone when John would call. He bore the brunt of just some horrific things that he said, but he quit calling because he knew my dad was there. Well, and again, I I think sometimes it takes a a person just to make a stand. Again, not on my watch, not to the point where I'm I'm not going to allow that to happen. That, again, is so powerful to say and to do. Well, Alice, as we start to wrap up, I'm curious about this for you. How and where should folks go to connect with you if they want to know more of your story, read some of your writings, things of that nature? Okay, so I have a blog, and it's poemachronicles.com, poema, P-O-E-M-A, which means God's work of art. I am launching a book in the fall. It's a middle grades fiction book about a girl who, has her mother has died and she is kind of stopped being she gets mad and she breaks the clock in her living room and gets arrested for attempted chronicide or killing time but it's okay she eventually gets off on accidental time slaughter so that's coming out if you go to trueplaygames.com t-r-u-p-l-a-y G-A-M-E-S dot com to play games. Then I am the writer, the director of narrative for, and I have a wonderful partner in this, Bob Hostetler. We have comic books, we have videos, and we have games that are all Christian based that are actually fun to play and not, but are very adventuresome. That's where you can find me. Targeting that younger audience to kind of draw them in, I'm guessing. Absolutely. Like that idea. I have some middle schoolers that come to mind, so we'll see if we can direct them towards your way to see if maybe they can get a little interaction in a good way, not the mind numbing games that people are playing these days. I don't even play video games anymore. I don't have time for that. I know, I know. But that's our goal is that we don't want kids to numb out. We want them to have something redemptive and engaging that there's so many things that get normalized out there these days. Why not normalize? kids having faith and having to use that faith as they navigate through their lives. Of course, they're animals wearing the costumes of other animals, but they really are just kids. Our little rim verse, as we call it. So they're animals wearing animal costumes? Yes. That's fun. So like a lion wearing like a penguin suit, maybe? We have Maple, who's a tiger bunny. She's a bunny, but she's wearing the costume of a tiger. 
because she's pretty fierce and she feels like she needs to have a tiger to let people know who she really is. And then we have have Oliver, who's a a fox wearing a bear costume because his parents mysteriously disappeared and he was adopted by a bear family. And so he's trying to figure out what it means to be a bear and what it means to be a fox. He's a little confused about it. How creative. (laughs) Different animals in there struggling with various things. It makes me think of the Wuzzles. I don't know if you remember that cartoon in the 80s. Nobody ever saw the Wuzzles. They had an amazing (laughs) theme song, too. Somebody's going to have to go out and Google the Wuzzles. Because there are these two things that mesh together, like lion and a bee. And his name was Bumble Lion. So Wuzzles. To check that out. I don't know how we got Wuzzles. Worked it in. Check that (laughs) off our box today. Alice, I think it's only fitting. We talked very serious, I felt like today. Very heavy subject. I feel like we need some levity, some laughter. You open to that? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, I noticed you brought a cup and it had some ice in it. Yes. So I brought a cup too, and it has a dye in it, very different than what you have. Okay. We do this thing at the end of the show. It's called Senseless. It's very silly. We have new questions. So we're very excited to share our new questions. Very creative. So again, the silliness at the end of the show, the reason why there's a dye is the questions are random. You don't answer all six, but they're just random. So I'm going to roll for you if you're okay. And don't think I'm going to cheat you out of giving you a worse question. or Okay. All right. I have that tendency according to Twitter. (laughs) Just kidding. Well, my Twitter account is all jokes. Is it? Good. See, there you go. All jokes. Yes. My Twitter account is very jokey too because I'm never on it. But anyway, here we are. All right. Question number four. There's the proof. Yes, there's a lot of light blue and that four is in fact also light blue. Kind of fitting maybe for you in this moment. I don't know. All right. Drum roll. I feel like we need one. Who would play you in the story of your life? Um, Anne Hathaway. I could see that. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like there's the face, like you kind of have a Anne Hathaway face. That's a compliment, by the way. I hope I you have, take that uh, as people such. People tell me that I look a little bit like her older sister. I, I literally was just going to say that. You're taking it out of my mouth. Like I can't even get it out before you say it. That's not fair. That's cheating. Yeah. And she's also kind of goofy because even though I write about very, very serious things, I'm writing now for children and I get very, very silly in it. I'm pretty silly. She has the ability to be pretty silly too. I'm trying to think of a movie I've seen her in that I didn't really care for. Alice, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. We appreciate you letting us check Alaska off our list. (laughs) Thank you. I just want to say thank you so much for being here today. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, guys and gals, kids and campers alike, that's it. That's all. That is, in fact, our show today. I know. It's, it just goes so fast sometimes for me. I just look down and here we are. We're done. Maybe that's a great question. Lead with and maybe end with. Are you done? Are you done with everything in life? Are you at that breaking point where you're maybe sitting at the red light and you're like, I, I can't, I can't go on anymore. I can't continue to live this life. I want to be like Alice. I want to get out of, I'm going to play on the name. Yes, I can't help it, but I want to get out of the wonderland. It's a fake facade. Now, listen, I'm not saying I'm pro divorce. I'm actually kind of not, I'm not. I think you should try to work it out if you can. There's a wise woman that near and dear to my heart. And that's my granny. She did walk away. She got a divorce from a guy that was really mean and really abusive and really physical and probably was very narcissistic. I didn't know that word back then because I was just a little kid. My grandfather was not very nice to my granny. Do I think she's in heaven? You bet your bippy I do. Do I think that stops people from going to heaven because they get a divorce and they walk away? No. God does say he hates it. There's a reason why. Go learn about what that means. I'm going to steal that from somebody. But as we get out of here today, I want to just remind you of this. If this is the moment where you say enough's enough, let me know. I'd love to try to help you get out of that. Try to do what I can to help because it's important to me and it should be important to you. Remember, of course, this as well as we jump on out of here and that's this. Remember, do not ever forget. Remember when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. want to say thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for hitting play today. Never take that for granted. Not one second. And again, can't wait till next week when we walk in other people's shoes.